All right. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to the next Benson AP US History lecture. Today's topic is America moves to the city. Whoops, I still have me on the screen. I need to switch to the 2D mix. There we go. Uh, that was a close call. That would not have been fun um, for you guys anyways. Um, the urban growth in America in the late 1800s, early 1900s. America moves to the city. Uh, I'd love to start with this photo, one of my favorite all-time photos, the building of the Empire State, the construction of the Empire State Building, the crew having their lunch, as you can see, absolutely no safety devices. Um, before we dive in, I'd like to start with a quick literature mention, and this, these are the books of Theodore Dreiser, or Dreiser, I'm not sure the correct pronunciation. Uh, he wrote several famous books, two of his most famous, Sister Carrie and An American Tragedy. He was considered kind of one of the greatest um, authors uh, who focused on that shift of uh, rising urban America, the move from the rural to the urban. Um, he's known as the great urban novelist, and I've seen his name appear on a lot of AP exams lately too, and I had never even heard of him until recently. So there's definitely an idealism for the rural in his stories and the challenges of moving from small town to urban life. This urban growth in this time period is absolutely incredible. I think I've showed you guys this chart before. The city growth was just literally exploding. You've got industrialization, you've got uh, the growth of factories and the failings of the, of the individual farms and all these factors combining together and you're gonna see some kind of incredible city growth rates. So we see in 1860 that only 19, almost 20% of America lives in the cities. By 1900, we now see that we're getting closer to 40% lives in the cities. And then in just the next uh, 20 years, we move up to 50%, where half of America is now urban and the other half uh, rural. And this is a pretty dramatic map from the 1880s that shows population density. And you still see that even though the frontier is gone, there is this pretty distinct line of where there's no longer a lot of people. Uh, let's do the world's fastest history lesson that goes through just kind of the um, chronology of developments. Things that helped the city grow included technology and transportation. Uh, the earliest way to get around in the cities was what they called the omnibus. The 1820s, it was a bus, but it was, of course, pulled by horses. Um, pretty remarkable little system. Here's a couple of old pictures of the people traveling around on the, the bus or the omnibus. Um, by the 1850s, they improved this a bit. Still pulled by horse, but they had rails, so it was a little faster and easier on the horses. Uh, and then from there, of course, the train... Uh, will soon spread to city technology. There's one more in France, actually, of your uh, horses on grooved rails. Uh, 1879, they started building elevated tracks above the city was the big idea of uh, trying to avoid um, all the traffic and stuff. Here's a great shot where you've got the horse-drawn carriage below and then the elevated train above. Uh, this was a big deal. And then groundbreaking, uh, oh, almost forgot one, the electric trolley cars. These were popular in Colorado Springs. These were all over the place. These were running on electricity. No longer do you worry about the horse. You also don't have to put it up in the air. They could travel on the regular streets with cars, but led to all kinds of uh, congestion problems. There's another one of your trolleys. And then the huge breakthrough for the big cities, 1880, 1897. In 97, Boston built the first underground subway line. New York City followed in 1904, and it is a radical uh, change for the uh, transportation systems in the cities. Underground, completely out of the way, and the lines start to go everywhere. Here's this huge digging project to create uh, one of the big subways. You can just see some of the old pictures. The inside of the car is quite fancy, and so on and so forth. Um, 1878 is the first electric lights inside a building. And, of course, this will lower fire risks and increase your productivity. You can work all night. And then the buildings start to climb upwards and get taller and taller. The brilliant uh, artistic and modern Brooklyn Bridge, 1883. Uh, and then... The buildings really start to pass 10 stories in the 1880s with the help of steel and the electric elevator because, of course, more than 10 stories without an elevator was a, a long way up. Um, and they were off. And these are um, the same fellow who did the child labor photos also tried to capture the building of America's great skyscrapers. So I wanted to share a couple of those 
some of the earliest of the big buildings with you. We saw this on our opening slide. Uh, just another shot looking down as they're up there working to build these buildings that are inching forwards. Um, let's talk about some of the problems and challenges that the cities face. Uh, your book starts by stressing the importance of the difference between private, public, and no man's land. Right? So we'll di di dive right in here. Private enterprise really is supreme in the city. The author of your history textbook stresses that innovation, uh, technology, all those things I just showed you, the elevator, the skyscraper, the, um, the, the trolleys and things, these were all private. These were all for profit. And that profit motive really led to a lot of great innovation. But that alone was not enough to make the cities work. And the other side of it was the municipal government. And these Governments, as these cities grew and grew and passed a million people, would have enormous political power and the ability to organize great public projects, public works. Um, you're not there's not a lot of profit involved in, early on in making sure, say, the poor have water or sewage, uh, bridges, parks, things like that. And then the no man's land, of course, will be those forgotten spaces in between, especially in the growing slums, which we'll get into in quite a bit of detail. Uh, so if we want to talk about problems, the biggest issues, who was left out, what was going on, what were some of the big um, challenges. Um, the cities grew unbelievably fast and there just wasn't the a legal structure in place to protect uh, especially the the poor the immigrants so you had massive overcrowding you had these tenements I'll show you a chart in a second or a map that shows you uh, the, how they, those were maximized to get the most amount of people in with the least amount of um, windows or breathing space sanitation was a horrific issue garbage rotting and everywhere it was just disgusting um, just a couple of typical lodgings for somebody who was new to town in a place like New York City. Transportation, we just went over the developments and how that's going to change over time. Uh, unsafe water, cholera, typhoid were very common. Rising crime, the crime syndicates were growing faster than the police uh, were able to deal with them. Fire was a huge issue, especially back before you had electric lighting when it was gas lighting. Um, Chicago, San Francisco having major, major, major fires. Uh, there's a famous photographer who will come up again later, Jacob Rees, who took pictures all across the city in the slums in the late 18, early 1900s. And these pictures were really shocking to people because the, the political class, the wealthy class, the upper classes had no idea just how bad things were and how foul the slums were and how poorly built and, and the suffering of, of, of men, women, and children, and, and so on and so forth. It was a very real issue that was being captured now by... Um, by the, his photography and put into his books. Um, just a few more images, famous images from the past. This is the Dumbbell Tenement Plan, and I wanted to point this out. And there was a famous law, the Tenement House Act of 1879. And these were, um, this, the 79 law required that every room where somebody lived had a window that opened to plain air. But they kind of got around it with these air shafts that, in fact, when there was a fire, would lead to just the more rapid spreading of the fire. So these laws didn't really end up protecting people all that much. They, they're considered a major failure all the way until the 1900s. Um, the other problem was that, you know, you didn't have elevators and you were 20 or 12 or 14 stories up. So people were just throwing their garbage out the windows or into the courtyards all the time. So it was very... Very horrible living conditions, slum conditions out of control. This won't really be reformed until the later uh, part of the first decade of the 1900s. Uh, just a few more images. Uh, let's talk about the rural idea. Frederick Law Olmsted is an important figure in urban history because he's the guy who really brought this ideal of green spaces in our cities. Uh, American cities were doing a great job of this in the late 1800s. Uh, huge emphasis on... Uh, and he's the one who develops and designs Central Park, which is America's probably maybe one of the world's largest urban parks. And it's absolutely huge and fairly magnificent if you've been around Central Park. This map shows you. You can see in the center, that's the uh, park. And on the uh, north and south, those are the streets and the city. And it's just right there in the middle. This idea of bringing the urban into the rural. Here's another good photo on the top that shows you just how massive this park is. Um... There's a little section in your book comparing Chicago and Berlin. It is rather interesting how they talk about how American cities were lacking in culture and history and tradition, 
and yet they were superior in infrastructure, technology, more people had toilets, water, transportation, and things like that. So you pick which one you'd rather live in. Um, social class in the city, another topic that's important to look at. Um, we're going to talk about uh, the divisions. You have your urban elite who is already in, starting to move to the countryside before the 1900s, right? Either the ritzy neighborhoods downtown or the outskirts um, where they could be away from the pollution and the crime of the ghettos. The growth of the suburban world was already beginning at this point. You have a, a growing middle class. You have the fastest growth in the country is in things like managers and clerks and salesmen and ad executives and engineers and chemists. And so they're going to be on the ring surrounding the cities as well. Um, and a big stress of her home ownership. Um, and as more and more trains allow people to take the train into town, people start to spread farther and farther out, and family sizes start to get smaller as well. And then I'll just mention briefly women and the cult of domesticity. Um, we see this best illustrated through the popular magazines of the time, Ladies' Home Journal and Good Housekeeping. This was all about the woman's role in the house, taking care of the husband and the kids and serving the family. Um, another social or cultural issue of the time one of my favorites, the uh, Society for the Suppression of Vice. This fellow, Anthony Comstock, uh, and his followers made it kind of their mission to get anything obscene out of the males, but it's kind of almost humorous to look back on what they were calling obscene. If you see that newspaper article, Ulysses, the famous um, <clears throat> Greek and Roman mythology story, um, that was considered too lewd because there were, you know, adult scenes going on in here, and you couldn't talk about sex or contraceptives or anything like that. You can see a cartoon making fun of him. He was terrified of the woman's female figure or um, just all kinds of things that they considered lewd. He's chasing a poodle there because it's half shaved and that's just way too much, you know, scandal for him. Um, brief discussion about religious changes in America in this time period. And the first one is the growth of Judaism. Almost a quarter of a million Jews come or are, are in America by the end of the century. Um, and a lot of them are coming from Eastern Europe. Um, we'll also talk about the Episcopal Church. The Episcopals uh, were famous for sort of their emphasis or stress on materialism. Uh, the, the books uh, that talked about and the Acres of Diamond, he was an Episcopal. The whole idea of getting more wasn't against God, it wasn't any kind of a sin, that being rich and successful in business was really a blessing of the church. The Roman Catholic Church is growing majorly in this time period. It becomes one of the largest uh, denominations in America. Um, but speaking of denominations, we have this huge diversity. By 1890, there's 150 different kinds of churches in America. So we're literally an explosion. Uh, anywhere from the Salvation Army, considering counting as a group, uh, to the Christian scientists, uh, and so on and so on and so forth. Let's talk science. Big, big category here, science, education, and popular culture. Uh, Darwin and his Origin of Species comes out in 59. This will, of course, have a huge impact on society. Um, high schools are uh, growing up all around. Compulsory grade school education at this time, which means that in this time period, only 6.5% of Americans are graduating from high school. That's shocking. Shockingly low if you think about it compared to today, but even today if you look at this chart on the left, we are shockingly low. We're 77% graduation rates. I don't know how Germany has 103% graduation rate at the top there. I guess they have more kids graduating than there are kids. Um, but anyways, uh, we still have a ways to go to where we should be perhaps, you could say. But uh, we've made a huge progress since 1900. Um, the newspapers at the time were famous for their sensationalism. It was called Yellow Journalism. We'll get more into that later. A little dramatic flame. This was a cartoon making fun of the newspapers or complaining about the newspapers. It's a printing press and all the little devils being spawned out um, because they were exaggerating and working for a profit and selling stories and trying to, to, to really just blow things up out of proportion to sell papers, of course. Uh, we'll talk more about the famous journalists, uh, Pulitzer and Hearst, a little bit later. The most important literature of the time in your list, you have names like Walt Whitman and Emily Dickinson and Mark Twain. This is the era of Mark Twain, Stephen Crane and his Red Badge of Courage. Uh, but the best-selling book, and one of the best of all time, is this book called Ben-Hur by Lou Wallace or Lewis Wallace. This comes out in 1880 and will be the number one bestseller in America all the way till 1936. And it's a story that takes place in biblical times. Uh, it becomes a movie 
in the 50s or 60s, and then it gets a new total second life and becomes another bestseller for another decade or two. It's absolutely incredible. It's about some characters who are living at the same time as Christ, and it goes into a sort of a fictionalized uh, telling of the story of the Bible but from a different perspective. Um, on the other side of pop culture, we have the rise of professional sports and vaudeville uh, entertainment, the, the theater, a lot of blackface was going on here, a lot of making fun of and using the stereotypical goofy images of African Americans, sold big time, um, all kinds of stuff. Prostitution was on the rise uh, in a big way in the 1880s and 90s. Um, historians are now saying the birth of the gay subculture, so it usually was considered the 20s or 30s, but in fact... We now know that places like New York City had a thriving gay uh, underground culture in the 1890s. Um, baseball and sports, uh, high culture, as they say, the development of art museums, and Carnegie was building his libraries, which was sort of a gathering for the upper class and the educated classes. The Gilded Age, uh, we'll get into this when we do politics next week of this era, but it was a book by Mark Twain that really was the, a tale of today, The Gilded Age. It talked a lot about... Um, the politics of corruption of the time period. Um, reform. It's another, not a major era of reform, but a small era of reform. And we're going to see some changes. In 1890s, a million women enter into the workforce by 1890. Uh, still pretty divided by uh, who these women were. If you were an African-American woman, you were doing domestic service. If you were a white woman, you were a secretary or a clerk or an operator. And if you were an immigrant woman, you were in the factories. So that's an important distinction. Uh, again, black women, domestic service, white women, secretaries, store clerks, telephone operators, and immigrant women were mostly in the factories, especially garment trade. Uh, families were getting smaller. And we have some really important women in this time period who really uh, make a name for themselves in various fields. Uh, on the right, you have Carrie Chapman Catt, who's kind of the new face of women's suffrage movements, and she actually will start in the 1880s and 90s and keep fighting until she's successful in 1920. Women get the right to vote. Ida Wells over here is the famous anti-lynching advocate, trying to put a stop to lynching uh, across America, dedicating her life to this. Uh, and, of course, Charlotte Perkins Gilman in 1898, who wrote her famous book about uh, women being more productive and how much that could help the national economy, trying to, you know, be very realistic and thinking about it from the pocketbook side of things. And then finally, the WCTU, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, led by Frances Willard. This was a massive women's organization, got very political, no men allowed, and they were working very hard and moving towards prohibition, getting rid of alcohol. The l amount of drinking in America was, was hitting kind of a all-time high, and so these ladies were doing everything they could to work towards reducing, but also often eliminating uh, alcohol from American life. Um, that's a quick version of what we're looking at here today, and that wraps up American History AP US Unit 6, Part 4. Thank you for following our lecture. Bye.